everyone. Yesterday, after I posted the video about the pivotal battle of King's Mountain, a student reached out and wanted to know, so what was Tennessee during the revolution? Was it not a state? And the answer is no. Tennessee wasn't a state at the time of the American Revolution. It was considered Southwestern territory belonging to the state of North Carolina. But by now, the American Revolution is over and the American government is broke. They have no money from fighting this lengthy and expensive war. And they need cash, they've got bills to pay. So they send out word to these states that have these territories, why don't you cede that land, give it back to the federal government so that we can sell it and help pay this war bill. So North Carolina agrees to do that. And when they do, the people living in that Southwestern Territory, the settlers of Watauga and Cumberland, they're quite pleased to hear this because they're not happy with North Carolina anyway. They feel like for some time, they've been ignored by that government. They've had to solve their own Indian problems. They had to resolve issues without any guidance and they think they would be better off on their own. So they set to work. They're going to make a state and they're going to appoint everyone's favorite leader, John Sevier, the new governor. They're going to write a constitution. They're gonna write a bill of rights. They start taxing citizens. They start solving problems. They make trade agreements. They do all of the things they're supposed to do. They get the ball rolling and North Carolina comes back and says, "Never mind. we've changed our minds. We're gonna keep that land after all. Now, North Carolina, probably did this because wealthy land speculators said, are you people crazy? You can keep this land and make a fortune yourselves. Well, John Sevier and these other people who have spent all this time making a state, they're not gonna listen to North Carolina. They're gonna travel to Philadelphia and they're gonna ask Congress to recognize them as a free and independent state. So off they go to Philly. Well, now then we didn't have a constitution. We were operating under the Articles of Confederation. And under the Articles of Confederation, nine out of 13 states had to agree, yeah, you could be a state before you could become one. So off they go to Philly. And when they get there, they say, look, we've made a state. We've got a constitution. We've got a government in place. And we even have a name. We're gonna call ourselves the state of Franklin. Franklin? Franklin? Well, actually, let's change that to Franklin because that sounds better than Franklin. Franklin, after being Franklin. So they call themselves the state of Franklin. Well, they start voting in Philly and they need nine states to say yes. Only seven said yes, because North Carolina had so much power, they went to the other states and said, don't go along with this. And they didn't. So they come back to the territory and they disband, they dissolve, they can't make a state. Well, now it's 1787, the leaders are in Philly, they've gotten rid of the Articles of Confederation and they've made a United States Constitution that North Carolina agrees to accept. When North Carolina agrees to accept the um, Constitution, as part of that, they say, hey, you know that land y'all wanted? <laughs> you can have it back because, well, frankly, uh, we're quite tired of this Indian problem and, you know, go ahead if you want to deal with that. So the government, the federal government, takes that territory. They rename it the United States south of the River Ohio, which is quite a mouthful, so everybody just call it Southwestern Territory. And George Washington is going to appoint William Blunt, the new governor and the superintendent of Indian Affairs of this new Southwestern Territory. When now Blunt and his brother owned a bunch of land in the Southwestern Territory, he'd never been here. So he travels to the Southwestern Territory to get to know the people and to get them to trust him. And he meets with the recognized leaders of the day, John Sevier and Robertson, James Robertson. James Robertson was father of Middle Tennessee. And of course, we all know John Sevier. Well, they spend some time with Blunt and they start to trust him. They recognize he's an honest guy. Uh, Robertson even is going to name his son, William Blunt Robertson, after him. So, 
what starts getting the trust of the people who are living in the Southwestern Territory. At the same time, he's gonna deal with this big Indian problem. The Cherokee, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Creek, they're upset. More and more people keep coming and their hunting lands are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's a big problem for them. So Blunt works out a deal. He tells those Indian leaders, look, I'll pay you $1,000 a year. Just let the people stay there. And they'll stay within this defined area. And the Indian leaders accept that, except for the people don't do what they're supposed to and they keep spreading out and the hunting lands keep getting smaller and smaller. So now the Indians go to Washington, uh, George Washington and the federal government. And this is in Philadelphia. And they say, look, we've got this problem. Why don't you people do what you say you're going to do? So they send out word to the settlers, look, stay there and stop attacking the Indians. The settlers ignore them and keep doing what they're doing. Well, now, by this time, the population has really exploded in this territory. And Blunt knows, hey... We have enough people to make a state. Under the new constitution, you've got to have 60,000 people living in a territory. Then you can go to Philly and you can ask the government, can we become a state? Well, here's what we're going to do. We've got about 75,000 people here. We're going to make a state. And then we're going to go to Philly and say, we made a state. So Blunt sends out word to the settlements, send me your best people, your best representatives. We're going to work this thing out. So they do. Now, these men are smart. They've just written a Bill of Rights and Constitution in Philly. No need to reinvent the wheel. We'll just use that and make it about our new state. And they do that with one important change. They say in the new state, any man, white or free black, over 21 can vote. That was a really radical change because in nearly all the other states, you had to be a landowner to have voting rights. So that was a really brilliant idea. White free black man, 21, you can vote whether you own land or not. So they get everything all worked out and Blunt's gonna go to Philly and say, hey, we've made a state. So off he goes. And when he gets there, Congress isn't really pleased. This isn't how this works. You tell us when you have the people and we say, go ahead. Well, Blunt and them had gone ahead and there is a complication. There's a presidential election going on between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Half of Congress knows people in Tennessee are all about Thomas Jefferson. And they think we can't have a president like Thomas Jefferson in the United States. And if we let these people become a state, they're going to elect him. So Blunt does what they always do in Philadelphia and which is now we call that Washington, D.C., the head of the government or the seat of the government, he's going to make some backroom deals, some handshake deals. They work out this voting thing. And on June 1st, 1796, Congress votes. And this new state is admitted as the 16th state to the Union. And John Sevier is going to be the governor. William Blunt's going to be a senator. And Andrew Jackson is going to be a congressman. And best of all, they've given the state a new name, Tennessee, after the Tennessee River. A poetic name, a name shrouded in mystery, because we don't know what it means, but it was a name that was given by the early people. Tennessee, a beautiful sounding name for a beautiful state. Now, I'll be back on Monday, and we're going to be learning a little more about Mr. Andrew Jackson.